Hallelujah. Well, I want to speak to you on a very controversial, maybe, subject. I want to speak to you on the subject of good advice on fatherhood from a bad dad. Good advice on fatherhood from a bad dad. Let's pray. Father, I ask that during the next few minutes that you'll speak to us. I pray that everybody here will just at least get something. I pray they'll get one thing that they'll be able to leave here with and hold on to. In Jesus' name. And everybody said aloud, amen. amen. You may be seated. A few years ago, we were having a retreat. In fact, we used to call those retreats encounters because we had faith that everyone who came to one of those getaways was going to have an encounter with God, and it happened over and over again. We watched God fill people with the Holy Spirit and bring deliverance and freedom. It was wonderful. There was always one session on the fatherhood of God, and that session was based on the story of the prodigal son. On this particular night, after I finished ministering and talking about the love of our Father and how important it was to really love the Father and how important it was to come to grips with your relationship with your Father, no matter how good or, or bad that was, something happened in the room. Never seen it before. I've never seen it since. But it was as if this heaviness of the Holy Spirit settled over the crowd. And we had a lot of new inductees to Eagle Creek in that meeting. That is, they were fresh in the program. Most of them didn't know God, and most of them had never, ever heard a message quite like this one that dealt with father issues. And one young man began to cry out in the most plaintive, gut-rending cry I have ever heard. He just stood in the middle of the room and wailed and cried and groaned. And then all of a sudden, a young man that was standing next to him joined him in the cry. And then another and another. Until the room was filled with young men in that retreat who were crying out from the deep wounds and hurts of a father that was absentee or a father who had led a dysfunctional home or a father that was abusive. In our leadership meeting after that session, we began to go through each young man's story and realized that most of those that were crying out in such pain had never known their father at all. When Father's Day rolls around, I always understand that for some, this is a very good day, a great celebration. It always was for me. I had the best dad in the world. But for others, this is very difficult. Some of you carry scars that were inflicted by a dad. Some of you are under heaviness that you wouldn't have to deal with if your dad had just been more mindful of the fact that he had a responsibility to love you and to lead you and to teach you and to impart truth to you. And some of you feel that the whole issue a fatherhood, as far as you're concerned, has to just be written off because there's not one redeeming shred of anything that you're able to salvage from your relationship with your dad. Here's what you need to understand, however. Some of the best fathers had the worst dads. Some of the most affectionate fathers had no affection at all, not one single time. 
from their dad. Some of the most loving fathers had the most abusive dads. Some of the most present fathers had the most absentee dads. And when you look in the scripture, there's a dad here that I want to call your attention to that was called a man after God's own heart. And yet, he was a very bad dad. His name is David. See, this is what I've discovered about men of God. It doesn't matter how great, how holy, how powerful, how anointed a man of God is. He's always missing something. There's always a glitch in the equation. So when you look at men like myself who stand here and preach the gospel, don't ever be gullible. Don't ever be fooled into thinking that we've got it all together. Ladies and gentlemen, we simply don't. We have glitches. We have weaknesses. We fail. And when it came to David, he was a man after God's own heart because he understood how to enter the presence of God and worship. He understood how to take on the cause of the Lord. He understood how to lead a group of men and to mold them into a fighting unit that is unparalleled in the history of the planet. He understood how to sit down and write a song that would bring the tears to your eyes and a delight to the heart of the Father. He had a lot going on when it came to ministry, but when it came to his family, he just wasn't a very good dad. Now, I believe that this bad dad has some good advice for us today. So let's just jump into it. Here's the first thing I see in his life. He communicates very clearly that having a child doesn't make you a father. Having a child doesn't make you a father. First Chronicles 3, 1 through 3. I bet some of you have never read this, or if you have, you've probably forgotten it. Felt it was just incidental. But there's a truth here. The following in order of age are David's sons who were born while he was in Hebron. And then it gives the list of all of the sons. It gets to verse 4 and it says, All six were born in Hebron during the seven and a half years that David ruled there. In Jerusalem, he ruled as king for 33 years. And many sons were born to him there. Many. We don't know how many. And then it goes on to talk about those sons. And in verse 6 he said, and he had nine other sons. Okay, now what we've got is we've got six, then we have many, and then we have nine. The man is prolific. In addition to all of these sons, David had sons by his concubines. Oh my. This man has many children. And he also had a daughter, Tamar. Here's the amazing thing. When you look at the fact that David had a house full of kids, you cannot find anyone in that list other than Solomon that distinguished themselves in any certain way. Why is that? Because while David was able to find a way to invest himself in his army and invest himself in his kingdom and invest himself in worship and invest himself in ministry and invest himself in songwriting and invest himself in creating and invest himself in building. He somehow never found the way to invest himself as a father. Just because you have children does it make you a father? Here's a second lesson. Being a father means reproducing your character, not just your genetics. It means reproducing your character, not just your 
genetics. I talked to a man who's very well known, minister of the gospel. This is what he said to me. He said, you know, Denny, he said, the fact is, we who have great anointings sometimes don't do very well as fathers. And I looked right at him, and I didn't buy it, and I told him so. I said, that's a cop-out. The fact is, you have not made an investment in your children. I knew his situation. His son had come and lived with me for a while, and I understood that what was going on was that this gentleman was everywhere in the world except at home. What you got to understand is this. As fathers, we have a responsibility to reproduce not only our genetics, but our character. We're to pass it on. Let me say this to you. If your son watches you tell white lies, then he'll tell white lies. If your son watches you act one way in front of one group of people and another way in front of another group of people, then I can promise you that's the character or non-character that he will reproduce. I'm always, it seems, reaching out to someone who's having a problem in a minister's home, either the minister themselves or or their wife, or, or maybe even their children. And this morning and last night, I've been dealing with a young lady who is a grown child of a man of God. And it's a man of God that I love with all my heart. And I'm involved in reconciling this grown woman of God to her father who is in ministry. And let me just tell you, it's always sad, but it's always a joy when you're called on to be an intercessor. Amen? And what a joy it is for me to stand as an intercessor and to talk to this young woman. But I could read you the text that I received just minutes ago from her. And this is what she asked. Is this kind of hypocrisy just normal in a pastor's home? Folks, let me tell you something. Pastors have nothing to do with it. It's not normal in a Christian's home. You are to be exactly what you are at all times in front of everybody. If you're not the same on the street as you are behind the pulpit or in the pew or at your job, then something's wrong. You don't have a Sunday face and a Monday face. You are to be what God has called you to be because the Word of God says He gives us the power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on His name. We're not just believers in something. We've become something because he's changed us from the inside out. Sir, let me say this to you. If you feel like you don't have the character to pass on, all you have to do is to cry out to him. And then your testimony will be the same as the Apostle Paul. The things I once loved, I now hate. And the things I once hated, I now love. Jeremiah said it this way. The day will come when Almighty God will create a new covenant and He will write His laws upon our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not have to pass on character that we cannot ourselves apprehend. But we pass on character that has been birthed by the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the third thing. The art of fathering is called communication. And that means listening. Can I say that again? The art of fathering is called, it has a name, it's called communication. And that means listening. Most important thing that I'm learning to do, and I, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I've mastered any of this. I am a father in making, in molding, and in process, and will be to the day I die. But I learn from my grown children all the time. And this is what I'm learning. i got to be a better listener. 
They don't need my answers. They don't need my feedback nearly as much as they need my attention and my ear. You see, the problem with most people that are scarred in life is they don't truly feel like they have been heard. And when you don't feel like you've been heard, then you naturally don't feel like you've been understood. And when you feel like you've not been understood, you don't feel like you've been covered. It is so important that we as fathers just listen. Do you know that I discovered something in my life years ago that has helped me be free in so many areas? I, for a long time, felt that I had to have an opinion. And one day, it just dawned on me I don't have to have an opinion if I don't want one. So I have from that time to this, in certain moments, just determined that I'm not going to form a, an opinion. If I don't form it, it doesn't exist. So people will try to get me into arguments or conflicts and sometimes I'll say I don't have an opinion. And their response is always, of course you do. And I look at them and say, no, I don't. It's of course you've got an opinion. I say, I don't have an opinion. Say, everybody has an opinion. I don't. How can you say that? Because I haven't formed one and I'm not going to form one. So I have no opinion. It's amazing when you can leave that parking place clean in your brain. That opinion space. You know? Just leave it clean. I don't have an opinion about that. You just walk away feeling free. <laughs> Amen? Now, there are certain things we need to have an opinion about. I have an opinion when it comes to six days of creation. I think God is able to do it in six days as, as good as he can do it in six million years. I just think he's God. And I don't think that he would have gone to the trouble of veiling the language in Genesis 1 if he hadn't really done it in six days. I believe that Noah sailed on an ark and that all of the creatures of the world were destroyed except Noah, his family, and whoever was with him on that boat. I believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish. I believe that. I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. I believe that he literally walked on the earth. I believe that he performed miracles, that he opened blinded eyes. I believe that he caused paralytics to jump and leap and praise God. I believe that Jesus Christ was literally raised from the dead on the third day. I believe that one day in the eastern sky, we are going to see the manifestation of Jesus Christ riding on a white horse who's coming back to redeem the planet. I got some opinions. I got an opinion about you. I believe the best is yet to come for you. I believe that no matter how the devil has fought you, how he's tried to bind you, how he's tried to afflict you, how he's tried to accuse you, that the word of God is more powerful than everything you've ever faced. I believe that you can climb out, out of a gutter of despair and loneliness and futility and that you can begin to soar to places that you never dreamed you could go and do things you never dreamed that you could do. I believe that Almighty God is for you and and if he's for you, then who can be against you? I believe that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I believe that Almighty God is in this place right now. And that when you touch him, everything is going to change. Somebody right now, give the Lord praise. That had nothing to do with what I'm preaching about. But that's probably the only part you'll remember. <laughs> what I want to say to you is this. Is that sometimes when I'm talking to my son or my daughter, I don't need to have an opinion. I just need to ask, how's that working out for you? <laughs> Come on, somebody. How many of you would love to just hear that from your daddy one time in your life? How's that working out for you? How 
How many of you would like to hear him say, well, I know you'll make the right decision. Don't tell me what to do. Believe that I can do it because it means more to my character that you believe I can make a right choice than it does for me just to accept the choice that you're making. Now, let me say this to you. I'm standing here after having had the privilege of having seven children and a lot of years of practice. In those years of practice, I have made innumerable mistakes. I look back on some of my mistakes and I just wince. You know what that word means? Watch. That's what it means. I can think about my mistakes with my kids and go, dang, what in the world? I have one cuss word. I want you to know that. It's D-A-N-G, dang. Used it all my life. My dad always corrected me every time I used it. He said it's a replacement for something, but here's the fact. I'm not saying that. I'm saying dang. And when I wince, I say, dang. Mm, dang. Why did I say that to that kid? You say, how far are you looking back? All the way back to when Denny Rodney was eight. Just stuff I said because I didn't, I didn't know any, but I was just stupid that day, you know? But I just, man, why did I say that? How could I hurt that baby's feelings like that? can't believe that came out of my mouth. Here's, here's where you have to go, though, in that. You have to understand the next thing after listening that this bad dad teaches us. And that's that fathers are just human. Fathers are just human. I, Pastor Larry Stockstill said something to me that really impacted my life one time. He said, he said, you know, Denny, if you're going to be free, you've got to let everybody else be free. And I have lived on that one word for 15 years. It has helped me so many times I can't even tell you. You know, Denny, if you're going to be free, you've got to let everybody be free. Here's what I will tell you. If you're going to be human you got to let everybody be human. And fathers are just human. You know, in, in 2 Samuel 7, 19, or 7, God speaks to David, and he tells him what he's feeling in his heart about him. And I'm telling you, if you could get a love letter from God like David received, in 2 Samuel 7, it would probably last you for the rest of your life. It is prolific. It is divine. It is glorious. And David, of course, is overwhelmed after God speaks these words to him. And this is his response. And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord... You've also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, listen to what he says, is for a mere human. He had an understanding of his humanity. Everybody who does a good job at anything is going to have to have that understanding first. You're going to have to be human and you're going to have to let everybody else be human. You see, here's the fact. Some of you right now are struggling with me just talking about a father, and you're kind of just sitting there waiting to get through this message about fathers because every recollection, every memory, every emotion having to do with that man is negative. Here's what you've got to understand about your dad he was human. You say, but my dad abused me. I know. Sometimes our humanity stinks. 
Sometimes it scars. Sometimes it speaks out of a, a, a reservoir of hurt that, that has been experienced in their own lives. It's, it's amazing when you begin to see what humanity can do, the destruction that can bring. But yet, you must understand that on our best days, we are still human. When you understand it, you'll give yourself more grace, sir. And you'll also give your dad more grace. You'll be able to move on. And you'll be able to see God do things that you never thought he could do in you and through you. You will have your heart reconciled to the heart of a father that didn't have a clue simply because you know from this bad dad you learn he was just human he was just human number five being a father means it's no longer about you interestingly enough sometimes a man begins to get it together late in his years and that's kind of what happened with David at the very end he just began to pull it all together and even though he hadn't been a really good father to all of his children he begins to kind of be that guy that Solomon needs the Bible says this then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build the house of the Lord the God of Israel and David said to Solomon my son I had planned to build a house to the name of the Lord my God but the word of the Lord came to me saying you have shed much blood and have waged great wars you shall not build a house to my name because you've shed so much blood in my sight on the earth see a son shall be born to you he shall be a man of peace I will give him peace from all his enemies on every side for his name shall be Solomon and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days he shall build a house for my name he shall be a son to me and I will be a father to him and I will establish his throne in Israel forever now my son the Lord be with you so that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord your God as he's spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord grant you discretion and understanding so that when he gives you charge over all Israel, you may keep the law of your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and ordinances that the Lord commanded Moses for Israel. Be strong and good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed more than anything in the world. David wanted to build the Lord's temple. It was the shining moment of his dreams as he began to think that in the future, one day, I am going to lay the cornerstone of the temple of God. One day, I will begin to see the cedars of Lebanon as they rise to the heavens as great pillars in front of the house and the temple of my God. One day, I will begin to see the artisans and craftsmen as they began to, in very detailed and artistic form, to create a house worthy of the King of Kings in our midst. But none of that was going and every one of his dreams crashed. That's what being a father is all about. He called his son and he said, I'm not going to get it done, but you are. Interestingly enough, when God began to speak to me about Denny and Sarah uh, taking the baton, this was the scripture he gave me. This was the one. He said, he said I called you here to help your dad finish well. Because I knew there were going to be conflicts that could have taken this ship down. And I would need you to stand here and to fight wars. I would need you to stand Sunday after Sunday without accusation and without panic and to lead these people from one leader to another leader. He said, I've made you a transition piece. And he said, the glory of the former house under Rodney Duran will be a glory that will be diminished only in the third generation. Because when we pass the baton to this young man and woman, this man is a man of peace. And there will be an anointing and a power and a glory that will fall on him. 
and will fall on Sarah that is going to cause this place to be filled many times and will cause this city to be reached in a new place of authority and power. The Lord said, you are the David generation, but I raise up the Solomon generation to build a house for me. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sad about that. I don't feel diminished about that. I don't feel left out. I am so glad that the Lord used me at all. And I am so thrilled over the fact that as I have the joy of handing this baton, that there are going to be people that are your peers that have left this church. They're going to come back from the north, south, east, and west. We're going to see young families as they fill this place. Us gray and white-haired folks are going to just stand and applaud everything you do. We're going to watch you get creative. We're going to watch you move into the arts. We're going to watch you move into business. We're going to watch you move into finance. We're going to watch you begin to change the infrastructure of this city. We're going to watch this become a shining city on a hill that cannot be hidden. You won't just hear about it on social media we're going to hear about it on the airwaves of the spirit as people are drawn to come to this place from the four corners of the earth folks let me tell you the best is yet to come and if you're a father you have to understand it's not about you anymore it is about the next generation somebody get on your feet and thank God because there is a generation of power that is coming in this house come on give the Lord praise Give him praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. Glory to the name of the Lord. Keep standing, please. Keep standing. You say, Pastor, you kind of did a hybrid thing on us. We thought we are going to hear about dads, and that really wasn't about dads. It was really kind of about the kingdom of God and all that. And uh, you kind of fooled us a little bit about that whole fathering deal. Well... I'm sorry, but I'm going to give you one last point that you can take home with you. Listen to me. Listen to me. This is it. Point number seven, because we're skipping point number six. Listen to me. Fathers, like everyone else, have an expiration date. Fathers, like everyone else, have an expiration date. First Kings 2 and 10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. You know, I remember when God spoke to me and he said, go to Shreveport and help your dad finish well. Do you know it never crossed my mind about him expiring? (laughs) I I was just thinking that one day he would get to the place where he didn't want to pastor the church anymore and he and I both would retire together. That's what I thought. I never planned to take the church. I never planned to pastor after him. I just thought my call was to come here and help him finish well. I just wanted to just battle at his side and be there for him until he decided he didn't want to pastor the church anymore. And then God, through a series of dealings, showed me and had to show me that I was to follow him as a pastor. And I went to him, and he just said, Oh, hallelujah! You can hear him now, can't you? Those of you that know him. He was so excited. But I remember that morning when he left the earth, when he expired, I drove up to the, um, to the White House and I'd received the call. I have never in my life heard birds singing that loud. Folks, can I tell you that the birds were singing so loud that it was almost too much, like you wanted to reach for the volume knob? There were birds singing everywhere around that White House. They were singing to the top of their voices. And I walked in, and there he was. And you know, he, he had been um, drawn, you know, with this condition so that his, his face was disfigured, really, during those years. And his 
hands. But when his spirit left, that old body that had been so crooked and had brought so much pain to him for the last five years, it just relaxed, and he was beautiful. He was, he was uh, handsome. I just picked him up, kissed him, held, held him. And I said, thank you. Thank you so much. And then they came to get him. And they put him on the gurney. And they started outside. And uh, I told mom, I said, I'll follow him outside. So I, I followed him. And the gentleman was so kind. We just, we just had such good people, didn't we, Mom, that helped us. They were just good people all the, all the way around. So grateful for those people that helped us. He said, do you want me to cover his face? I said, no, if you don't mind, don't cover his face yet. So I just walked behind him, just looking at him, talking to him saying things that I knew he was hearing, but he wasn't hearing them there. That was just my focus point. He was hearing them in another realm. So just before they put him into the uh, vehicle, I stood there behind him, and uh, I said, just give me a moment. And I looked up to heaven, and I said, well, God, I said, I remember the day you told me to come help him finish well I just want to say mission accomplished he finished really well very very well and I kissed him and they covered his face and you know in that moment I thought man for five years I prayed for him to die every day because I couldn't stand to see him in that condition. You know, we men, we approach it differently. Mom's praying for him to stay, and I'm praying for him to go because I'm just going, my, he didn't want to be in that situation. And yet, when he finally left, man, whew, the world got empty real quick. Rodney Duran was no longer on the planet. Oh, my, what are we going to do? What are you going to do as a city? <laughs> what are you going to do as a church? What are you going to do as a family? That's why in the scripture, the Bible says he slept with his fathers. In the scripture, there was nothing as significant as a father passing away. And that's why a father would be placed at the place of honor where fathers slept. Here's what you got to understand about your dad. Whoever it is, whatever he has done or how badly he's acted up, please hear me. And this will maybe put everything into perspective for us on Father's Day. Fatherhood has an expiration date. And here's what I would tell you. Today, if you have a dad that you appreciate and love who's ever done anything for you, you need to call him. And you just say to him, I want to tell you this, I love you. If you've had differences with him, then I want you to say to him, I know we've had differences, but I want you to understand there's nobody like you in the world. I love you. Even if... He's done things that cause you not to be able to say, I love you to him. You say, well, when is that? Well, there are situations where you can't use those words that there are. Sorry. You feel it in your heart, but it's hard to say that. You just call them. Just listen to their voice and understand. Fatherhood has an expiration date. Yesterday, 
I got a call from my little brother who I love with all my heart, Pastor Keith Kraft. Pastor Keith Kraft had a heart attack yesterday, and the doctor said that he shouldn't be here. It was a miracle that he survived. He just finished working out. He was he was just going to it on his on his riding bike. He was down in Florida riding books, and he was he was riding his bike back from the gym, and boom, he has this thing, and he goes in, and the doctors came in one after another and said, Sir, it's 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 a miracle that you're alive. Well, I want to tell you something. I wrote him this morning, and maybe I can read you my text and then we'll pray and we'll be done. But hallelujah. No, I can't do that because I can't turn that thing on. Uh, here's what I said to him. Here's what I said to him. I said, yesterday stunned me because I've never considered a world without you in it. And then I began to tell him how much I loved him. And I said, don't you even think about dying because I need somebody to speak at my funeral. Here's what I want to tell you. Listen to me. That stunned me for one reason. Because I've never considered a world without him. Here's what I want you to do as you think about your dad today. I want you just to take a glimpse. I don't want you to stay there long because it gets morbid. And that's stupid. Don't do that. Live in the now. But take a glimpse. Take a glimpse. To what it will be after the expiration date. Because the date is already written in future history. And in that moment, you express your love, your appreciation, and your gratitude in a brand new way. Look at me. It will change everything for you. One day, all the fathers here are going to sleep with their fathers. It'll be a good thing. It'll be glorious. We'll be in heaven. But the world will change. And we must anticipate what that will be like.